I'm Alfonso Winker. And I'm Trina Olson. And together, we're the co-founders of Team Dynamics. And this is Behave. Hey, that was weird in the parking lot. It was super <laughs> weird in the parking lot. I'm really sorry. <laughs> But it was weird. It was totally weird. Because you, what did you say to me? Well, tell our friends what you said to me. I, um, I was standing on the side of my small car and you were on the area of your big car. I had just given you maybe a, what is it when it's a high five goodbye? It's like a goodbye five? Yeah. Basically. A see you later five. Yeah. Because we were about see to. in five. Yeah. We were about to drive in separate cars to the same place, which is always funny. Yeah. I appreciated that every time we passed each other on the highway, by the way, we didn't make eye contact. No, we're like, you could be anyone, and I'm <laughs> driving fast. Right, because, so. like, what does it mean about our po- power dynamic that you've now chosen a different lane? And we picked different parking ramps. Yeah. I like the freedom that we have here at this. Fr- your body, fr- your choice. Yeah, thank you. I think I said, oh, here's what I'm thinking about for the podcast today. I'd like to be, like, really chatty. And I And your clenched. entire face changed. My whole everything changed. I clenched, <laughs> and I said... You didn't do anything wrong. Which is, by the way, then I clench the second you say something like that. But I wish you wouldn't have told me that. <laughs> it just like flew right out of my mouth. And I was like, can you drive safe? And we got in our cars. Yeah. And then I thought about what I had done <laughs> in the car. And when we got here, I just said, hey, you know what? I had a big reaction to a little thing and it gets to be true for you and not and different for me. I also like that you always extend your hand. We're yes. not a hand-holdy friendship no. necessarily, but when something big is happening, I'm like, oh, God, we're about to touch. It's like E.T. a little bit. It's because touch is my love language. It's also mine. <clears throat> and so we know that about each other. Mm-hmm. What I think people don't get a lot is that when touch is your love language, it doesn't mean you want to be touched a lot. It means touch is important. Right. It doesn't mean like lay on me all the time no, or like you. give me a massage, but no, it's like you. I'm showing you this is big and important to me because like I'm like, here, just let me... Hands? Cool. Uh, it's why I want a special handshake with the, uh, like a like a elementary school good teacher. You come in from the hallway and I know that you think I'm special by having a special handshake for me. And I am deep in consideration of that proposition We're, since we formed this company not, three years ago. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Great. But I think what's interesting about the moment that we had just before yeah. stepping into this lovely Studio G mm-hmm. here is I think the thing that kind of washes over us is, oh my gosh, are we fighting? Yeah. Or what does this mean? What just yes. happened? Yes. Usually it's like, what just happened? How big of a deal is it? Because also like 10 days ago, we had a pretty big actual conflict, right? And so it is like, what size is it? What does it mean? What does it mean about our relationship? Am I being oversensitive? Am I reading into something? So it's like my brain can go pretty fast when I'm trying to unpack a situation. Right. And we're experienced people in the workplace. And so we're not unaware of when something weird happens. We're like, ooh, something just happened or my tone change or your tone change or your face or your whole whatever. Right. Or like now we're talking very quietly or now we're talking really loudly or like, ooh, you're standing up and I'm looking at the floor. Like, right. What, or I got like really this? formal and professional and began taking many a, a note that yes. I may or may not give to HR later. You don't know. So HR. Yeah. Hello. I think a lot of times HR in an attempt to create a rubric for people creates policies and practices around conflict that preference or favor one way of doing conflict. And what we know about conflict is that there's a really big menu and there are a lot more choices. And so when we think about conflict and workplace behavior and layering on experiences of race and gender and culture, we want to make sure that folks are thinking about a bigger menu of options. Yeah. And I think this idea about conflating conflict with fighting Mm. or having a values disagreement or we're not headed in the same direction and don't share the mission anymore. I think whatever has happened to all of us before we got to the workplace, we go from zero to 60 really fast in terms of like what something could mean. Because, you know, at Team Dynamics, when we talk with folks about conflict in the workplace, the first thing I say is, so I'm assuming y'all are really smart. 
right? And folks do that bashful, like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty smart. I, yeah, I pretty much am. I said, okay, great. So my assumption is if you have a bunch of smart adults in a room talking about something that's important to you, it is highly unlikely that you'll all be thinking the same exact thing at the same exact time. So it's just this belief that unless we are in 100% agreement, going in the same sequence at the same pace with the same level of caring, something is wrong, Mm. right? There's like a fissure when in fact, you know, what we'll talk about all the time is we want people to bring their best selves, which means we've got their good, juicy thinking and it doesn't mean it's always exactly what I'm thinking. Right, right. And um, you use the word agreement, mm. which I think is a place to dig in a little bit. Because when we teach folks how to manage conflict, not resolve it, mm-hmm. but how to manage conflict, we are asking folks to consider the next best path forward together. Yeah. Not to sit together until we think exactly the same thing. And I know we've said conflict a bunch of times already. Mm -hmm. And before we talk about this menu of options, Mm -hmm. should we define what we mean when we say conflict, especially when we're thinking about workplaces that are mixed across race and gender and when we're bridging across culture and identity? Fine. Okay, yeah, we should. That is a great idea. (laughs) So when we say (laughs) conflict, we don't just mean a regular old disagreement. Yeah. And we don't mean fighting, no. right? You can be in an argument with a person you care about, with a loved one, with somebody you live with, with a family member, with a coworker, and it not be conflict. Sure. So we mean conflict when two things are present. One is emotional upset. Mm-hmm. I care enough about this thing or this relationship that I am feeling some feelings about what's going on. Right. Like I'm invested. Because right. if I'm not invested, let's just do it your way. Your idea sounds fine. I half care. Go ahead. Exactly. Yep. And then the other piece is we perceive our goals as incompatible. Oh, I hate that. So I'm saying, let's go left. And you're saying, let's go right. We think that it would be impossible for the team to go both left and right. And we're pretty emotionally upset about it. That's a conflict. So now we've come to, we have to choose a path. And I feel like if we choose your path, then I can't ever go down my path. Yeah. If you get your way, I can't get my way. Right. So here's my truth. I really have been on the internet lately. Yeah. And you know how Jada Pinkett Smith is doing these red table talks? Yes. So she has somebody on this week, I think. And it's a relationship counselor situation, right? They do a lot of like interpersonal relationship conversation because it's her, her mom, and her daughter. And one of the things he says, because he's talking about like marriages, is when there's a problem, it's really important to remember that you're both on the same side and together you're fighting the problem. You're not fighting each other. Mm. And I was like, yes, in a workplace, it's exactly the same where we think about we're trying to get the same thing done, right? And this sort of follows our intercultural development work that we do. So we'll link to that in the in the description so folks can read more about how to find out about their conflict style. But you know what was so fascinating when we decided to work together full time? After we had a joint bank account, you and me. Mm-hmm. After we had quit our jobs that had things like health insurance and paychecks. Remember that? Yes. We learned that we have opposite conflict styles. We have wildly different conflict styles. And this is where that menu comes into play. And we're going to talk about the menu in just a little bit. Let's talk about that menu I keep referencing, Trina. The conflict menu. Yes. Yeah. So we draw from the Intercultural Conflict Styles Inventory. We affectionately call it the ICS. There's a bunch that we could dig into when when we reference a menu of choices, but I think there's some core aspects that we should talk about. And when we were just talking about our goals feeling incompatible and having that level of emotional upset, how we relay that looks really different. The expectations, the rules, the policies, the practices in most workplaces favor a way, but what feels right or most useful or most authentic for each of us is going to look a little bit different. So with your permission, I would love to talk about 
our two styles and sort of the, the menu of options. Oh, for sure. And I'm going to add a layer for me, which is just that I think it's not just that U.S. workplaces are favoring a way. I think it's that they allow only one way. Mm. It's like worse or whatever, you know, or whatever. Or what I mean, it spiritually for me, it's way worse because the kind they favor isn't my kind. Right. If this, if the preferenced or demanded, uh, yeah, or allowable way or allowable or professional, and I'm using oh, air okay. quotes, way is different than how I would do it. I'm in conflict and now I have to put additional energy into using a particular style that might feel really far away from me, given who I am and how I am. And you're already worked up about the content of the conflict as well as you, you really care about me or us or so that's hard. Right. And we know workplace cultures are created by identity groups and we decide as an identity group that a particular way of doing conflict works or doesn't work for us. And so then what happens is, let's say, a group of, I'm looking at my business partner, white women created a company mm -hmm. and then created the policies and practices and protocols around conflict. It may be that at the time there was a shared way of doing conflict among that group. Yeah, and the underscored vibe is always, and isn't my way the better way, right? right? This is how our company decided to do it. So can't we all agree this is the most evolved, best right way right and then imagine me a man of color coming into the organization mm. trying to do conflict my way and realizing at every turn i'm doing it wrong yeah you're the weirdo you're not you you don't seem to understand what it is we're trying to accomplish in our special sanctum of kind conflict or whatever it is we're doing so the menu okay i've been saying it a bunch so i should probably talk about might it might as well so when i'm in conflict yeah i prefer to tell stories or ask another person to help. You're a really good storyteller. Yes. And I sometimes have to remind folks around me to stay with me. Mm -hmm. I might say, I've learned enough about myself to know, like, I'm about to tell a story, so stay with me. Mm -hmm. And I know for you, because you care, yeah. you want to bring it right to me. Yeah. And so that can feel really far away. Either that use of a friend or a colleague or storytelling and that desire to bring it right to me can feel really hard and far away. Yeah. And it can feel like someone's coming in hot or somebody is tattling or gossiping, mm -hmm. right? When in fact, the way we're showing we're caring for me is to keep it in the confines of our relationship. That's how I'm showing you how important you are. And the way you're showing me that you care is getting help from other really smart adults who care about you, who care about me, who care about how we come up with a cool solution. Right. And that it's important to remember any biases or judgments we might have about what is professional or unprofessional. Yeah. When we're in conflict, we have to remember we might be surprised by how particular bodies show up. So I can imagine as a woman in leadership, how you what you may have been called or how you may have yeah. been treated because your preference is to bring conflict directly to the person you're in conflict with. Yeah. I mean, women are getting talked about, right? We get talked around, we get talked through, we get talked over. So I think recognizing that I have that like itchy spot. And what I appreciated is that you and I had that conversation and I said, oh, I get so nervous about you talking about me to other people. And then you set a short list back to me. You said, here are the people, you know, they care about me, about you, about how we are doing as a business. And I was like, oh, really deep breath. You're totally right. And how smart they are and how great for my ego that you're showing me that asking other adults for help, of course, can be really, really helpful. Right. And so no. part of that that first part of the menu is to first recognize our own preferences. Yeah. I have this preference for storytelling or for leveraging the wisdom of another person so yeah. that I can clean up the conflict well. And for you, you're pulling from a part of the menu that is about bringing it right to the person. So the first thing we have to remember is how we're going to deliver the message might look really different and it might feel close to or far away from our own preference. And neither is bad or wrong or more or less professional. Yeah. And I think as a white person in the workplace in the US, we've really been told that sort of quick and efficient, efficient is a word that gets used a lot as code for direct, right? Get right to the point, 
be really succinct. And it's actually a way that racism shows up in workplaces, which is I don't have time to listen to what it is you're describing to me when in fact what I learned from your storytelling is I have a better sense of the context. I don't forget it because our brains are wired to remember stories. So it's actually easier for me to apply that new way of being because I remember what it is you told me and I get a sense of how important it is to you, right? Which is just different. And when I think about wanting to come to you directly, one of the things I've learned and I, I think I've gotten better at. So I have nieces right now that are young and they're they're two of them are before those like letter grade moments. Yes. They're in the like N I S S plus, right? Which is like needs improvement, satisfactory, satisfactory. I always said needs improvement on like shutting my mouth. Yeah, I could I could see that. Social social. Okay. <laughs> You're extra social. Extra social. <laughs> so One of the things that I had said to you that I'm trying to go from like an NI to an S is the other day we use Slack to talk to each other because email is my most hated part of America currently. It's the part that ruins my life the most on the internet. And so we work on Slack, right? And so I Slacked you the other day because we needed to finish cleaning something up. And that's what we call it on our team. We had sort of paused a conflict because we didn't have enough sort of info. We weren't in the right headspace to sort of come up with a new solution. And we realized that we were at an impasse. We're like, let's take a break and come back. And so what I said to you as a person who prefers direct communication was, hey, when do you have time? And then it occurred to me to say this week so that it wasn't like someday later. In the future. Right. Because my preference is I'd like to talk about it yesterday. Now would be ideal. And later I could live with. Right. But so I said, when would you have time this week? And then we were actually able to make a plan so that my directness wasn't coming at you or catching you off guard. And so that I also was was sure that I could think about how to describe to you why something mattered to me. So I wasn't just missing all the detail and coming at you with the crux of it. So, yeah, I feel like we're, we're finding our way there. And then for me, I was able to prepare some of my stories mm-hmm. and I could give you backdrop and context mm-hmm. because the relationship is important. So I wasn't excuse making or trying to justify how I showed up in the moment where we both got really crabby with each other. And I'm curious for you, we've talked about this a little bit, but not a ton. As an adult person in a leadership role in an organization, what have you had to teach yourself to do or not do that is different than sort of any triggers you've had in your other relationships? Because what we find, right, is that sort of how we have been conditioned to experience conflict is what freaks us the fuck out as we head into the workplace. Right. Because it's how can I behave perfectly enough that if I do this just right, nothing bad's going to happen. And right in, in the U.S., right, we are really taught to be... I'm going to say things like quietly resentful or like have a seething tightness to our affects. Sure. So before I answer that question, I want to talk about the second part of the menu sure. so that I can use the whole menu to, yep. to, to answer your question. So the first part is about how we deliberate. Yeah. Your preference is to deliver directly to me. And yep. my preference is to use story and metaphor and, and other people to yep. help me make sense of it before the conversation mm-hmm. happens. The second part of the menu, and I think has a lot to do with this question you're asking, is about how we show we feel and care about it. Yeah. And my preference is to show someone how serious I'm taking a conflict by using fewer gestures, a lower voice, a pretty steady cadence, And not a lot of big affect. Yeah. But I really, really, really care in a big, intense way. And so I'm paying attention to my gestures and my voice and my face in a way that is a lot tighter and smaller than I am in most other conversations. Yeah. So as a watcher of you, I think folks know that you're extroverted by nature. So you're pretty effusive. When you are upset or worked up about something... And you're like six feet, 5'11". You're t- five a lot 11. taller than me. Yeah. yeah. You're taller than me. As a person bigger than me who your voice changes, your volume changes, your eyes change, and you get t- your your gestures just get smaller, right? And it's not a sign that you're shutting down. Like, right. that's not what's <laughs> happening. I'm not like, oh, is it going to faint? Like, what's going to hit me? None of that feels that way. But it's just like, oh, you can still be an extroverted person who in conflict – 
really develop sort of a restrained communication style. And it's, it's, I also had a colleague um, when I was doing campaign work who we were really different than each other. And when he got quiet, everybody would lean in because also really effusive. And they were like, oh, this must be, this is different. Mm -hmm. Something in his cadence has really changed. And the thing I know about you too, you're not doing it on purpose. You're not trying to get me to pay more attention to you by being small. Right. It's what occurs to me. It's what feels part of my programming. Yeah. And I'm not not trying to thrust it onto other people, but it's just what occurs right away. And I know for you, what tends to occur is like standing up or you might do something sort of big with your arms and hands. Maybe your face will get red or you'll increase your volume to show that you care. And I think the thing that I have to remember as someone that gets tighter in my expression is that that doesn't mean you are out of control or violent or um, can't be trusted. Yeah. But that in two really different ways, we are trying to show people just how much we care about what is happening. And so... Do you want to know what my mom called me when I was little? I would love to. I had a a great nickname. I was called Stamp Foot. I bet. Uh Uh-huh. Because as a little person, I was the youngest in my family. So my sister could just get her words out faster than me, right? Like developmentally, the difference between five and three is like a lot. Big deal. Yeah. And so if we were having an argument or, you know, we were figuring out sharing in our household, I couldn't get to my words fast enough. And so I would just stamp my foot. (laughs) It didn't really scare anybody. It's probably like cute and funny. Didn't feel funny to me. (laughs) But it was my way to try to say, everybody stop. Like you're not listening to me or you're not hearing me. Or I'm trying to communicate something because it makes a lot of sense to me. And I don't know why it's not making sense to you. So often I think this idea too, that when folks get big, it doesn't even mean that they're mad. Right. It It just means they care. Yeah. It just means the communication is big. Have you, I know you've traveled a lot. Have you ever been to a place that is just louder by nature? Like you're in a marketplace or you're at an airport or you're at a restaurant and you just think, whoa, this is like louder than I'm used to. Yeah. I think a lot of the bigger, so, you know, we're based in Minneapolis, Mm -hmm. St. Paul and a lot of the bigger cities that I've been to, there's just more. Yeah. And the way people need to communicate with each other has to be at a bigger volume or needs to be more expressive or larger because there's more people around or there's more distraction or there's noises from the city. So I think that it's a reminder that also how we express is uh, sometimes a result of where we are, the context that we're in. And so it's a reminder for folks that are thinking about shifting their behavior in conflict to think about this bigger menu, Mm -hmm. um, to remember that context really matters. And so it doesn't mean that because I'm in a context, I have to use that particular preference style. Mm -hmm. But to remember, oh, in this context, I'm a part of the cultural group or identity group that crafted this way of doing conflict. I wonder if I could slow down and remember that there's this bigger menu. So Mm -hmm. I'm going right to small gestures, low voice, storytelling. Mm -hmm. That's not the only way. And Could it be that because I'm in a position of power in this organization Mm -hmm. that I'm somehow sending the message that this is the only way and you can only do conflict this way here and be successful if you do it like me? Yeah. I know we're going to get the opportunity to talk about this a whole lot more in future episodes, but to land the plane today, I could imagine that there are people listening right now who think, yeah, yeah, this is all really interesting, but like that is the better way, right? And they're thinking of one of the pieces what we just talked about. So I really want to name how much I've learned by experiencing you caring a lot and having a big idea and me caring a lot and having a big idea that I've really learned that fighting for my way isn't ever getting me closer to a cool, best, better, wise, inclusive decision. And so I think for me, I'm still in process of remembering that quiet doesn't mean you don't care, right? And that storytelling isn't gossiping. And for me, I'm trying to get all that imprinting out of women are out of control or overly emotional by emoting. And I'm trying to let myself just be the embodied leader that makes me a better contributor. So I think it's really receiving and believing that when you are in struggle, it's such a good sign that you care enough to choose 
to hear each other fully. And I think for me, I'm practicing remembering that when you bring me conflict to me, yeah. it's because you care about me, not that our relationship is on the line. Yeah. So I think with conflict coming directly to me, feeling really out of preference or far away, I have to start from Trina cares about me and we're in deep enough relationship that she cares enough to bring it to me. And actually, there could be something wrong in our relationship if she wasn't bringing the conflict to me. And so Mm -hmm. remembering the menu helps me remember that we're using our styles to, to show people what is important. And often it is, it can be the relationship that is at the center for a lot of people. Yeah. We spent our conversation today talking about conflict And it's actually one of our favorite topics to talk about. And we know that there are also moments of joy in our work. And sometimes working through a conflict can be joyful. Sometimes other aspects of the work are really joyful. And I had a really fun session with a client. I'm not going to talk about who they are, what exactly the breakthrough was, but we were doing some review together last week. And we were recapping many, many months of work that they had been through. And it was incredibly joyful (laughs) um, to watch them remember all of the culture and behavior change work that they had been through. They're in this moment of reflection and there was some wondering of, have we changed? And to sit with a group who said, actually, many months ago, we named some goals, we focused in on some things that we wanted to be different here. And actually, we're practicing those things that we wanted to be different. And we're experiencing each other and this work in a different way. And it was just incredible to watch a group of people remember that they had goals for themselves, and that they had shifted and changed and that what they were trying to shift in their workplace culture was absolutely possible. Yeah, sometimes it can feel like pushing on the ocean. And once you realize all this progress has been made, you're like, wait a second, I could keep going. We did it. We did it. That's awesome. So one of the things I do uh, when I'm not in front of a computer is I send myself emails when I see something cool that I want to remember. And just this weekend, there were three different commercials that I was like, oh, they're trying to talk about race and gender and sexuality. Oh, my God. So watching three really different sized companies do some commercials, I'm excited to dig in on a little bit and start to see ways in which folks are saying, hey, here's the impact of what it looks like when I am never represented when this Mm -hmm. product is being sold or when this company is talking about athletes or entrepreneurs. And there was also um, a new ad out. I'm curious how I feel about the whole thing. But the concept is it's a dad teaching his transgender son how to use a razor, Mm. right? And so it's just this interesting way that companies are catching up with who's actually in the U.S. living lives. And so it it feels like it's still in the infancy, but I'm seeing it so much more that I'm sending myself more emails (laughs) than usual. That's great. Yeah. So what resonated with you all who are listening today as we talked about ways of delivering conflict to one another and ways of expressing our emotions in conflict? We want to hear from you. You can tweet us at Team Dynamics LLC or send us your questions to team at teamdynamicsmn.com. Behave is produced by Levi Weinhagen in Studio G at the Glenn Nelson Center. Make good choices.